Today on Twin Cam, Melvin and I are at the Practical Classics Classic Car Restoration Show at the NEC in Birmingham. This is one of two major car shows hosted at the NEC each year, and this March show is the smaller of the two. This show is all about project cars, barn finds, working on cars, daily drivers, and the kind of stuff that isn't absolutely mint, and is all the better for it. Unlike the November show where we see people in suits polishing their garage queens, people here are wearing overalls and are working on improving their cars collectively and that makes this show the one I prefer of the two. But in this video we're not going to be going down that path, as for my overview of the sights of the show, here's a selection of the cars that drew my eye while wandering around. What better place to start than with Melvin, my 1991 Rover Metro on the Metro Owners Club stand. Melvin was the only K-Series Metro there, so in the end it was nice to have this car here. The Metro stand was right alongside the MG front wheel drive register, and this time all their cars were Metros, so a total of 10 Austin, MG and Rover Metros were lined up together at the NEC, along with another on the pride of ownership. And the one I'm going to focus on here is my friend Connor's 1983 MG Metro 1300. This car was taken off the road and shoved into a barn in 1995, five years before Connor and I were born. And over the past 12 months or so, he's gradually restored it, having partially rebuilt the engine, rebuilt the brakes, done a bit of welding, and it should be about ready for an MOT now, whenever he decides to put it in for one. The unique part of this car is that Connor has gone out and found all the incredibly rare 1982 model year MG Metro components and fitted them to this one, making it one of only a handful of cars that could pass for being a very early MG, with the black interior, green tinted glass and all the other little touches that only the nerdiest of Metro fetishists could ever hope to spot. And as is the theme, projects are the centre of this show, and a large section is dedicated to cars that are about to become projects, still in their barn find state. And another run-of-the-mill British Leyland barn find is this 1974 Austin Allegro 1300 Super. I must be in the minority in that I don't at all think the Allegro is ugly. Definitely not in Tudor form anyway. It's distinct and slightly weird, and that's just about perfect. An Allegro never fades into the background, and this one, being a Series 1 Allegro, has the feature everybody talks about, the Quartic steering wheel. Only fitted until 1975, it seems that single feature is the centrepiece of the Allegro's curiosity value in the modern world. And so it should be, with virtually every manufacturer now offering an emulation of that once strange design choice. But for an Allegro that's further along the track towards being saved, we have to jump over to the Allegro owner's stand and this 1979 Allegro estate that over the weekend was undergoing an engine transplant. I was filming this before the show opened on a Sunday morning, hence nobody being home, and by this point the crusty old A-Series had gone, replaced by a nice shiny example of one of Britain's favourite full-cylinder engines. But we all know the reputation the Allegro has. Not because it was a failure, far from it, but partly because it failed to move the game on at all, and wasn't as good as its brilliant predecessor. And outside BL, there was one manufacturer who took all the advances from across the European motor industry and planted them in one subsequently iconic vehicle, the original Volkswagen Golf. And this one is the GTI that everyone loves so much. I adore the Mark I Golf, and this one is right up my street. Though I usually seek out more basic cars as they're more indicative of society in period than a hot one, this GTI with steel wheels is absolutely my kind of thing. The blue paintwork, red trimmings, black wheel arches and subtle steel wheels are perfection as far as I'm concerned. But in a general sense, the Mark I Golf got everything right. Under the skin, a transverse engine with gearbox on end and front wheel drive. 
all suspended on McPherson struts at the front and a twist beam at the back. That's now the accepted recipe for any compact car. And while the Golf wasn't the first, it acts as the template for the modern car. And pairing that with incredibly pretty Giugiaro styling produces a car ice cool. And it remains nearly 50 years on. But in order to prepare for the Golf's launch as Volkswagen's most important model, its coupe-bodied sister was launched a few months before, ironing out any engineering issues. And that car was, of course, the Volkswagen Scirocco. And there was a decent little selection of Mark I Scirocco's together in one of the halls. But my pick is this 1980 GLI, making it a rather late one. And as per the name, this has fuel injection beside its four-cylinder engine. As a replacement for the elderly Carmen gear and still being produced by Carmen, the Scirocco was possibly the first ever Volkswagen to be a genuinely pretty car. And it stormed to taking a 15% share in the West German coupe market through its lifetime taking affordable and rather mundane mechanicals and making them into an incredibly desirable car, much like the Ford Capri did in the UK. But the Capri's biggest competitor wasn't what Volkswagen was offering, but the similarly rear-drive Opel Manta. And back across the halls is its Griffin-badged counterpart, a Vauxhall Cavalier Sport Hatch. This silver example is a 2000 GLS, making it the top of the range model with the faithful old 1979cc Camin head engine under the bonnet. My lack of Vauxhall knowledge is shining through here as I thought the 2 litre sports hatches and mantas all had fuel injection, but as there's no badging for it I must be lying to myself. The sports hatch and Manta is the only example of the characteristic Vauxhall droop snoot being copied by its Opel sister. And on a car that's meant to be sleek and desirable like this, it works fantastically. I adore the styling of these, more so than the Manta, thanks to the sleeker droop snoot without the slats and the badging on the B-pillar, proudly proclaiming that it's a sports hatch. In 1981, the Cavalier Saloon was replaced by an all-new car with, shock horror, front-wheel drive. And for the third-generation Cavalier, launched in 1988, the scene was all set. There were no shocks, no upheavals, and the Cavalier had already propelled Vauxhall right into the big time, competing with Ford for supremacy over the UK market. And so the Mark III Cavalier had an easier job than its predecessor. And sandwiched between two Mark I sports hatches is a Mark III Vauxhall Cavalier GSI 2000 16 valve. And this 2 litre Cavalier had a much more modern power plant, the famous Red Top. And the Mark III Cavalier in general is a car that I'm really starting to appreciate, and especially the earlier ones. In fact, I think this GSI is far cooler than anything being offered by Ford at the time with its deep bumpers, monoblock wheels, and most importantly, the lack of any silly wings. But by the late 80s, fast saloons offered by mainstream manufacturers weren't as popular as they once were, and were being overtaken in the desirability stakes by the likes of the E30 BMW, and in this case, the top-of-the-range 325 IS. This car is on the pride of ownership, and has belonged to its current owner for 15 years now. In fact, it's gone through a nut and bolt restoration, converting it to South African spec as a 325 IS Evolution, with a bored out engine at 2700cc, a dog leg gearbox, and other touches like the gorgeous red leather interior. It even has headlamp wipers. Glorious. I'm a huge lover of the E30, and though it'll come as no surprise to most of you that my chosen poison is the cleanliness and elegance of a more basic model, the work done to this one is exemplary. But turn the clock back by nearly 20 years, and the peak of the compact performance saloon market was firmly in the mainstream, with this 1973 Ford Escort Mexico. I still maintain that the Mark I Escort should be the benchmark for the styling of a mainstream family car. It's an incredibly pretty shape, with just enough coke bottling and curves going on to express something different from the humdrum of 60s and 70s Britain. 
but in a far subtler manner than the later Mark III Cortina. And that's all for the best. This was Ford at their stylistic peak, and come to think of it, might be the best looking car Ford has ever made. And this one in yellow with the graphics is incredibly cool. But one size up from the Escort was the Cortina. And for the hot Cortina, Ford once again got what was, at the time, the most decorated Formula One constructor involved, Lotus. What Colin Chapman's team really wanted was a new engine, but what resulted was one of the most successful and revered performance saloons and homologation specials of all time, the Lotus Cortina, with suspension, engine and final assembly all done by Lotus. But when the Mark II Ford Cortina launched in 1966, things had to change a little bit. In order to meet Lotus's demands and streamline production, the Mark II Lotus Cortina was built at Dagenham by Ford, alongside all the run-of-the-mill Cortinas. But under the skin, that Lotus engineered suspension and twin cam engine remained, even sporting an appropriate badge on the back, indicating the power plant that started off life as the humble Ford Kent engine, only to be turned into a proper racing engine a decade down the line. But that engine didn't only find its home in the Lotus Cortina and Lotus's racing cars, as their road cars were also fitted with that famous four-pot, and its most famous recipient is probably the Lotus Elan. I have to apologise for the framing of some of the shots across this video, as with people milling round I wanted to keep out of the way as much as possible, and sometimes that means staying as close as possible to the cars. The original Elan is definitely on the podium for the best cars Lotus has ever made, alongside the Esprit and Elise. But with its cute bodywork, pop-up headlamps and brilliant engine, it's so unassuming and cuddly, and I love that. But for a 60s sports car a little more left of field and much more homebrew, how about a TVR Grantura? The company's first ever production car. And as is fitting, the Grantura is a combination of parts from loads of other cars, including Volkswagen torsion bar suspension, Austin Healey brakes, and the centerpiece, the 1600cc B-series engine from the MGA. This restoration is an absolute credit to its owner, as an incredible amount of love and passion has gone into this one. It's as close as you could get to an original Mark II Grantura, with with care taken at every stage to stay true to the original production techniques and to use genuine parts. The Grand Tourer itself is such a petite little sports car, and my favourite ever TVR. It's as small as they could possibly have made it, and even I, at 5'9", can just about slide myself in. And if British racing green sports cars are your thing, then I just have to slot in my friend Kieran's 1972 MGB GT. And of course it has the same B series as the TVR, but this time in 1800cc form, producing about 95 brake horsepower. This car is a gorgeous example of a facelifted B, and whoever bought it new nailed the spec, with the Wabasto roof and tan interior. But Kieran has also added his own few touches, including a wood-rimmed steering wheel and the obligatory wire wheels in place of the original row styles. But only a few years after Kieran's MG was produced, British Leyland's sports car world was completely rocked by the introduction of the Harris Mann-styled Triumph TR7, one of the most controversial and discussed sports cars ever launched. And one of the big problems with the TR7 was its predecessor. The old TR6 had a 2.5 litre straight 6 with fuel injection and independent rear suspension. But the 7 had to make do with a 2 litre carburetor fed 4 pot and a live axle at the back. But realistically the TR7 was not a replacement for the TR6. It was meant to replace the MGB, but the Triumph name was used as it was seen as being more prestigious. But this one has a bit more pep as it's the exceptionally rare TR7 Sprint, with the 16-valve Slant 4 from the Dolomite Sprint, making about 127 brake horsepower. But before it was even officially launched, BL cancelled it, leaving just a handful of press cars having ever been produced, 
And this is one of them, making this one of the most exclusive sports cars in history. That Triumph Slant 4 engine has a bit of a dodgy reputation for cooling issues. But this engine wasn't first seen in a Triumph, but in a Saab. And an example of the Saab in question is this 1976 Saab 99 GLE. This engine was designed by Triumph, but as they were engineering it, Ricardo, the engine builders, put Triumph in touch with Saab, who were in desperate need of a new four-cylinder lump. An agreement was made and Saab began producing Triumph's engine themselves, and it was fitted to the 99 at its launch in 1968. But while Triumph had abandoned it by 1981, Saab developed the engine further, allowing it to live on for decades in famous performance cars like the 99 and 900 turbos. But just down the road in Gothenburg, Volvo didn't have quite the fascination with two-stroke engines or turbochargers until a bit later. But in the early 70s, they'd pinned down the general silhouette of their famous estate cars that would see service through to 1993, with this very late example of a Volvo 145. The better known 200 series Volvo was launched in 1974, but from the bulkhead back, it was almost identical to the older 140 series that debuted in 1966. The 140 was the first Volvo to feature the boxy silhouette, and through its life became a fantastic example of evolution over revolution. Through the eight year production run, almost every aspect of the car was revised or redesigned from the lights and grille to door handles and dashboard, to the point where a run-out 145 like this one shares a greater visual similarity to a 245 than to an early 145. The Volvo Estate became the archetypal big family car in the 1970s and 1980s, but as that decade ended, a whole new genre of family cars emerged, the MPV, spearheaded by the Matra engineered and built Renault Espace. With its famous spinning seats and endlessly variable interior layout, the big box on wheels wasn't an immediate success. In fact, it looked like a colossal failure, but as time went by and people realised the potential of such a car, every other manufacturer jumped on the bandwagon. And though the MPV has died a death in the past decade thanks to the rise of the SUV, it remains a class of car unmatched in the practicality stakes, but killed by stylistic trends. Sod the SUV, up the people carrier. But as people began to see the ownership of a 4x4 as a way to feel better about their social position, manufacturers were more than happy to sacrifice a little bit of off-road ability and create the modern SUV as a result. And one of the standout cars in that segment celebrates its 25th anniversary this year, the Land Rover Freelander. And this isn't any Freelander, but one of the original press launch cars, as featured in a number of magazines back in 1997. In fact, on the dashboard of this car is a copy of the very issue of Autocar in which this very car was tested. At its launch, the Freelander was a bit controversial, as it was seen as a massive softening of the Land Rover brand, allowing families something that looked chunky and off-roady without going to the expense of a discovery. So this was the first ever Land Rover with a transverse engine. And the basic 1.8 litre petrol engine in the Freelander is much the same as in two-wheel drive Rovers of the time, including this 1997 Rover 200 VI, the hottest offering in the R3 generation 200 range, with 16 valves and variable valve timing, producing 143 brake horsepower. This car is clearly undergoing some work to install the factory air conditioning system, hence its lack of a bumper. But with it, I think the R3 is a really pretty little car. Its styling has stood up fantastically well, and though clearly from the mid-90s, it still looks exceptionally smart compared to anything else in its class. And another Rover I still think looks great is its predecessor, the much more conservatively styled R8 generation Rover 200 and in this case a 216 GSI, making it the top luxury model with the 16 valve variant of the Honda D-Series. Unlike the R3 we just looked at, the R8 was a collaboration with Honda, 
resulting in both these Rover 200s and the Honda Concerto. And at the time, these cars were far better than the likes of the Ford Escort and Vauxhall Astra, making 1990 a rare occasion, with Rover having two of its models right at the top of their respective classes in the Metro and 200, before swiftly being overtaken again over the coming years. This particular car is a facelift 200, produced just before Rover began installing the grille onto the front of the R8, but still with the revised bonnet and front indicators. But having spoken of that competition, when the R8 was launched, Ford was still producing its Mark IV Escort, and in one of the other halls is probably the tastiest Mark IV Escort I've ever seen, this 1.6 GL Estate with banded steels, tiny hubcaps, grey bumpers and finished in a dull gold. For me, this is the perfect front drive Escort. I'm a big fan of the styling of the Mark IV Escort anyway, and estate cars are always the best choice, so this is right up my street. For some reason, the Mark III just doesn't appeal to me, but there's something about the trimmings and grillless front end that just does something to elevate the facelifted car. And though I've just said I'm not a huge fan of it, we have to remember what the Mark III Escort was actually competing with when it was launched back in 1980. And one of its competitors was the freshly launched Morris et al, much like this lovely beige one. This car's having some work done too, and whenever someone mentions an Etal to me, this spec is exactly what I think of. Although nobody would say it's a particularly attractive car, I do appreciate its styling. It seems a very industrial and functional way of modernising the old marina, just to keep it alive for a few more years until the Montego could be launched. And core, this one has period correct raised digit plates. And our final car for this first part of our look around the show is right next to the Atal, with this 1974 Morris Marina van. Commercial vehicles usually lead very hard lives, lugging things around and covering astronomical miles, and as a result, very few survive. But this one somehow escaped that fate, and has only had two owners across 48 years, covering a little under 35,000 miles. It was originally bought by the owner of a garage and registered to the company, but 16 years later in 1990 it was re-registered to the owner himself. The van was laid up in 1992 and was hidden away until 2014, when it was unearthed and sold to its current owner, who has completely restored it from the ground up. And that completes our first of two videos looking around some of my picks of the Classic Car Restoration Show. The second part will appear in a few days, but until then, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.